Section 4.2 is finding real zeros of polynomial functions. Before we do that, though, we need to review polynomial division. I'm going to do this very quickly, but if you want a longer review, I would suggest watching the linked video, 8.5 Polynomial Division. So polynomial division is just like regular long division. What you're dividing by goes outside the house. What you're dividing into goes inside the house. So I put this longer, this fourth degree polynomial inside. If I were missing any terms, I have every term from four down to a constant, but if I was missing any, I would actually put a placeholder. So let's say there wasn't this 60x, I would have a plus zero x right here so that everything will line up. What you're dividing by goes outside the house. So then you're looking, okay, what do I need to multiply this x by to get x to the fourth? So I need to multiply x by x cubed to get x to the fourth. So then just like regular long division, I'm going to multiply that back. x cubed times x is x to the fourth. These should always be the same exact thing. Unlike long division, these will always be the same exact thing. But then you also need to multiply this x cubed by this negative 5. So you get negative 5x cubed. Just like long division, you're going to subtract that off. I like to distribute my negative inside to both of these so I don't forget. So I made this positive, this negative, this positive. These should always go away. And then I add these together and I get a 2x cubed. Then I brought down my 7x squared and started over. What do I have to multiply x by to get 2x cubed? It has to be a 2x squared. Multiply that back, I get a 2x cubed, which should always be the same thing. 2x squared times negative 5 is negative 10x squared, and so on and so forth, all the way down the line. And then this one ended up not having a remainder. So my final answer is just this top part up here, x cubed plus 2x squared plus 17x plus 25. So now I'm going to do this same division with synthetic division. Again, if you need a longer review of synthetic division, there is a video, 8.5 synthetic division, that I suggest you watch. Synthetic division only works with linear terms that you're dividing by. Polynomial division, you can divide by any polynomial. Linear synthetic, you only use with linear terms. So for synthetic division, you take what makes your linear term equal to 0 and put that in the box. So since this is an x minus 5, I'm going to put a positive 5 in the box. And then outside the box is the coefficients of each of your terms. Make sure if you're missing a term, like if I didn't have this x here, you put a 0 placeholder. So if I have a degree 4, I should have 5 numbers up here every single time. You bring down your first number, so this just be stays a 1, and then you multiply. So 5 times 1 is 5. And then you add those two together. So negative 3 plus 5 is 2. And then you repeat the process. 5 times 2 is 10. Add down 17, and so on and so forth. So what you should notice is these are the same coefficients that we ended up with on the polynomial division. This here was an x to the fourth, so we go one degree less. That means this starts out as an x cubed plus 2x squared plus 17x plus 25 and that's your final answer. This last value on the end, in our case a zero, is your remainder. So this one has zero remainder. Synthetic division is a shortcut to polynomial division, but it only works when you're dividing by linear terms. If you're uncomfortable with this or don't know how to do this very well, you really need to watch the 8.5 synthetic video, synthetic division video, because this is going to show up in almost every single problem in the next couple of sections. So now the real part of section 4.2, real zeros of polynomial functions. Starting with, off with the remainder theorem, what the remainder theorem says is if you divide by a factor, then whatever the remainder is, is the same value as if you were to plug that number into the function. So for the previous example, we divided by x minus 5. If we did our synthetic division and got the remainder of 0, if we had plugged 5 into that polynomial in the very beginning, we also would have gotten 0. So those values are always going to be the same. So now we're going to use synthetic division to find p of 2. In the past, if we wanted to find p of 2, we would have had to plug 2 in for every x value and do a bunch of arithmetic. Now you can just do synthetic division. So you're going to put 2 inside the box. And the rest of the coefficients outside, I have a degree 4, which means I need to have 5 numbers outside, which I do, so I don't need any zero spaces. And then complete your synthetic division. So go ahead and pause the video and do synthetic division.
So when you do your synthetic division, you should end up with a remainder of 37. That's that last number on the end. So what the remainder theorem says is that means that if you had plugged 2 into the function in the beginning, you would have gotten 37. So the remainder is the same number as what you would have plugged in, what you would have gotten if you had plugged that x value in for x. Leading off of that, we have the factor theorem, which says p of some number equals 0 if and only if x minus that value is a factor of p of x. So if you go back to the first synthetic division example, we divided by x minus 5 and got a remainder of 0. So based on the remainder theorem, that means that p of 5 would have equaled 0. So that means that x minus 5 is a factor of that polynomial. If I had factored that polynomial, one of them would have been x minus 5. So leading off of that, that means that x equals 5 is a 0 or an x-intercept of the polynomial. It's also a solution to the problem p of x is equal to 0. So we can use this synthetic division to help us find all this information. So in order to do this, we need to be able to find possible real zeros, and that's where the rational roots theorems come in. So go ahead and pause the video and write down these notes. So rational roots are all zeros that can be written as a rational number, and the way that we find the possible rational zeros are what's called our p's and q's. So p is all the positive and negative factors of the constant term. I always think of p as like a period, it comes at the end of the sentence, so it's the term at the very end of the polynomial when it's written in standard form. q is all the positive and negative factors of the highest coefficient, so that means that your Possible zeros are all of your p's divided by all of your q's. So now we want to determine the zeros of this polynomial cubic function and write it in factored form. In order to do that, we're going to do the rational roots theorem. So rational roots theorem says first we need to find our p's, which are all our positive and negative factors of 8. So the factors of 8 are 1, 2, 4, and 8, and we want both our positive and negative versions. And then all of our positive and negative versions of or q's, which are positive and negative versions of our leading coefficient, which is 2. So those are just 1 and 2. And our possible zeros are all of our p's divided by all of our q's. So for this first one, everything you're going to do, 1 divided by 1, 2 divided by 1, 4 divided by 1, 8 divided by 1, you end up with just your p's back again, those same values. But then these next ones, you're going to divide everything by 2. So 1 divided by 2, you're going to end up with a half. And then 2 divided by 2 is 1, we already have that one. 4 divided by 2, we already have that one. And 8 divided by 2, we already have that one. So we have 10 possibilities and at most 3 real zeros that we need to find. So of course we have a lot of extra possibilities than our actual zeros. So what we're going to do is, at this point, it's kind of a guess and check method. You pick a value to start with, one of these p's divided by q's, and plug it into synthetic division and start working. Usually I start with a 1 or a negative 1. So let's try it with a 1. So what we're looking for is synthetic division with a remainder of 0. For it to be a 0, it has to have a remainder of 0. So go ahead and set up a synthetic division with a 1 inside the box and try that synthetic division. So I put 1 inside the box, and then all of my coefficients outside, I have a degree 3, which means I have to have 4 numbers here, which I do. I did my synthetic division, and I end up with a 9 as a remainder. So because I ended up with a 9 as a remainder, I know this is not a 0, so 1 does not work. Normally, I would then go and check negative 1. I've already done this, so I know that negative 1 doesn't work. So let's move on and try 2. So do the same thing with a 2 inside your box for synthetic division. So when you do 2, you end up with a 0 as a remainder, which is what we want. So we know that x equals 2 is, in fact, one of our zeros. This one does work. So now at this point, you have two options. You can either continue to do synthetic division, and you can actually just do it straight off of this one that you have using these same zeros that you have over here. Or, at this point, I'm actually at a quadratic, 2x squared minus 7x minus 4. So you can just factor the quadratic just like you normally would. So that's the step I'm going to take. Whenever I get to a quadratic, I just use all my normal quadratic steps. So go ahead and pause the video and factor this quadratic. So if you continue factoring this quadratic, you end up with 2x plus 1 times x minus 4. So that means the entire factored form of this cubic 
is this x minus 2 from this first 2 that we found right here with our synthetic division, and then this factored quadratic. So x minus 2 times 2x plus 1 times x minus 4, which means our zeros are x equals 2, negative 1 half, and 4. So what that means is if you had tried negative 1 half, or 4 in your synthetic division, it also would have worked. You also would have gotten 0. So there's multiple ways to do this. So the biggest thing is starting with your p's, finding all the factors of this constant term. p is like a period. It comes at the end of the sentence. Your q's, which is all the factors of this leading coefficient. And then your possible rational zeros are p's divided by q's. Then it's just kind of a guess and check. Like I said, you'll start to pick up tricks to doing these a little bit quicker. But for the most part, part is just ch plug and chug. One thing that gets easier as you do reduce, so let's say you get to this point and wanted to continue to do synthetic division, now you have this new n term, this new p, so anything that's not a factor of this, you could cancel out. So when I go up here, 8 is not a factor of 4, so I know that one's not going to work now. So it kind of reduces your possibilities down a little bit. So the last part is the intermediate value theorem. What that says is if you have a continuous function and a is less than b, if f of a and f of b are opposite signs, that means at some point there had to be a zero in between them. If it goes from above the x-axis to below the x-axis, at some point it has to cross the x-axis. So we can show that there's a zero in between two x values using this intermediate value theorem. So we are given this function f of x and this interval negative one to zero. So what I want you to do is I want you to pause the video and I want you to find f of negative one and f of of zero. And once you have those two, I want you to decide, is there a zero somewhere between x equals negative one and x equals zero? So if you find f of negative one, you end up with a negative five, and f of zero is two. So because these are opposite signs, one is negative and one is positive, that means somewhere between x equals negative one and x equals zero, it does in fact cross the x-axis. There is a zero in that interval.